Welcome to Everyday Superhumans, the podcast where we interview ordinary people who do extraordinary things. I'm your host, Kyle. And I'm Caroline. How are you doing today, Caroline? I want to travel. Me too. Actually, I'm getting cabin fever right now. Where? Where do you want to go? I don't know. Anywhere. Anywhere. I'm fine with anywhere. Anywhere? Yeah, it doesn't so matter where. if I close my eyes and we just spin a little globe? <laughs> yeah, be fine. You'll go? Even yeah. though if it's like, I don't know. Where's a bad place to go right now? I guess uh, Somalia. Is well, I guess we're oblivious, place? so <laughs> yeah. we'll just like. So we need to get out more, which is why we should transition <laughs> onto like that segue, guys. Transition to Sue Ooh. Ann Tom's PhD. Our guest for this episode. Yeah, she's been to over a hundred countries. Yeah, uh, she travels on a really tight budget too. She literally, like, when she walked into the room with us today, we cut this out of the original recording, but she told us that she's going to spend New Year's Eve in Brazil. People yeah. don't always just say, I'm going to go to New Year's Eve no for, biggie. or go to Brazil for New Year's Eve. I may drive to my friend's house, which is five minutes away, Yeah, and then not go to Brazil, <laughs> but she does this all on a budget. Yeah. She is very effective with what she does. She she has a bunch of websites that we'll put in the show notes that she uses to help her get from, from point A to point B and everywhere else in between for it's a really tight budget. A load of yeah. clickbait that's <laughs> actually useful. She, I guess we could throw in there. She also speaks eight languages, which is really cool. I only speak one. And is that English? Oh, I could count to twenty in German. I thought that was gibberish. <laughs> no, but I guess it's English. <laughs> it's English. I speak Spanish. Ooh, I'm the I'm the short. Me llamo I'm Caroline. The... <laughs> well, anyways, let's uh, put ourselves to shame and uh, let's go move on to Sue Ann Tom's, the most eloquent. Most amazing globe trotter, globe trekker, whatever you want to call her, you will ever meet in your life. I'm so happy to know, to know her. Here is Sue Ann Tom's PhD, everybody. I think I'm going to cry after that speech. <laughs> Let's go on. I wonder if we could get a list of everywhere that you have traveled to have you ever wrote down a complete I'm list i'm working on becoming a member is it rolling yeah it's rolling you can pick up the mic if you want do i need to uh yeah it just gets captures it better it yeah. yeah there's a traveler's century club and there is not a chapter in louisiana the closest one is houston but it's for people who have visited a hundred countries and they do their country list online. And so I have printed that out, and I keep a running total. I also set some travel goals by that because it's a good way to inventory where you've been and where your gaps mm-hmm. are. I emailed the people in the chapter over in Houston and talked to them about possibly joining, saying half in jest to people like us, distance is no impediment. <laughs> and she said to me that they had far-flung members that I'd be more than welcome. So at that time, I only had 96 countries. But when you have 75, you can be an honorary member and attend, not, not join, excuse me. You, you're welcome to attend as a guest at meetings. So I have always thought I would get that started. But in answer mm-hmm. to your question, I keep like a score sheet i guess i would say <laughs> my husband as well wow and so he was four countries behind me i have added more than four since i was at 96 so mm-hmm. <sighs> whether we've added eight for him i'm unsure because there are a few places we go i've been he hasn't so it's account for him not for me etc so we both need to that's a good that's a good question because we both need to inventory that and get that up to date I'd love to 96 see that. Ninety-six countries That's and right. counting. That's that ridiculous. Really I've only been great. to one, the U.S. I never left the country. Is that right? Yeah. So you did not travel with your parents as a child. No, we only traveled inside the states. So I traveled a lot as a child. Not to say that. <laughs> not to nah. say, oh, I traveled a lot compared to you. We traveled within the states a lot, like to California. I think it was the furthest west we've went, and DC is the furthest east we've been. But typically, we usually travel to New Mexico or Colorado because my dad loves the mountains. And you travel a lot. How do you even travel on a budget like you do? Since you travel, you're always gone like every two months at Toastmasters. 
You're gone for two months, you're back for two months. You're gone for two months, you're back. I need well, to know this because I'm going to Europe. Yeah, she's going to Europe this summer. So. Fine. You have to think about what you want to get out of where you're going. And I do not travel in a luxury way. I haven't ever had the money to be at five-star resorts where I would be surrounded with millionaires. Nor is it a goal or something that attracts me. Because I speak as many languages as I do, I have always wanted to maximize the amount of contact I could have with locals who live there and to try to simulate as much as I could what daily life is like in that place. So one way that my husband and I are increasing now, our ability to do that is that we are using fabulous new websites, among them VRBO, which stands for Re Vacation Rentals by Owner. Huh. And we are now going for longer and staying in one place and taking mm. an apartment where we have a kitchen, which forces us to be in supermarkets and <laughs> markets. Mm. And you learn an enormous amount through food, especially, for example, if you're visiting. I traveled on the Trans-Siberian train and we carried some of our own food. And so we were in Russian supermarkets where it's another alphabet. And I remember my brother coming around an aisle in the supermarket holding a jar of something at eye level and saying, do you think this is mustard? <laughs> Because he had no clue. From, he, we had some cold cuts and we were buying some bread. Plus we had seen ladies sell bread on the platforms at the stops. Mm -hmm. And he knew he wanted to make himself a nice sandwich. And he knew he wanted, having some mustard would have been nice. He also knew it was something that was probably okay without refrigeration briefly. Mm -hmm. And so, which was smart thinking, really. And so I took one look at it, and from color, we didn't want, of course, to unseal it or open the lid. And from color and so on, I said, yeah, I think it's a good guess, and we'll have a surprise when you open it. Go, go for it. <laughs> So, so that's an example of how much fun it was to be in a supermarket having to rely on visual cues mm -hmm. of everything you were looking at because even the labels didn't help you. And then you really adapt to that culture that's too. Right. That's right. Because you end up eating from what's available, what the locals are buying right beside you in the marketplace. We were just in Norway. We were at the fish market in Bergen. And we were wondering about a particular fish that we'd never seen before. And the vendor was so very accommodating that he filleted the fish in front of us for us. Wow. It wasn't sold, and I did. it was a whole fish, and I didn't want him to do it because I thought he had a couple of them whole, two or three, and then he had one already filleted. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, but perhaps someone's going to come along and want It with the skeleton on, head, mm -hmm. tail, fins, and so on. He said, that's all right, that's all right. He so wanted to open it and teach <laughs> us and show us the bone structure and so on. Mm -hmm. Talking about it wasn't enough. And you're like, I'm a little queasy right now. <laughs> no, because okay. seafood and the whole, the whole animal world from, the, from water mm -hmm. is second nature to us. No, there's nothing we don't eat that's good mm -hmm. or anything thing that you've learned like any, pr any particular patterns while traveling that you see in people that you know you can trust them with like instantly or do you just need to become aware of the culture before you could i think there's a certain way that you can behave that will engen engender others to extend to you trustworthy behaviors first of all being honest yourself And understanding honesty, understanding price, understanding value. Not that I don't bargain because I do <laughs> in cultures where that is expected. In fact, it's part of the fun and they dis you disappoint them if you don't in huh. some cultures. Right. But there is a way to project, I believe, a straightforwardness that I think then is more likely... It's that old thing of treat others as you would mm -hmm. want to be treated yourself. And I have seen, I have been embarrassed by fellow people traveling, trying to pull a fast one, <laughs> and been, been sorry to see it happen. Um, it, it's, it's not unusual. It's seeing people mis, misbehaving and so on. 
so you have you have antenna and as you travel more and more and more those antenna get more and more sensitive i guess i would say in general travelers are taken as honest people or they mm. somehow wouldn't be traveling it's like <laughs> the yeah. crooks stay home i don't know I, I don't know where that comes from but in general a traveler meeting a traveler on the road will almost always be someone extremely trustworthy I mean, to the tune of leaving your luggage with them, leaving, you know, mm-hmm. almost always. I've never come across a fellow traveler fleecing me. Never. I wouldn't even imagine that, actually. Yeah. That's a good thing. It. That seems so foreign, doesn't it? Mm hmm. It's probably because traveling makes you so vulnerable to the new area that you're going to. So you had to be somewhat trustworthy before you go there. Or at least people, if you're vulnerable and somebody else is traveling with you, or you bump into other travelers. They see you as being like yourself. That's so right. They're like, hey, this person is out of their element. I'm out of my element. That's right. Let's, we could talk about this. You're each outsiders. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And you each are, are calling on a set of skills. And you've got insufficient or incomplete knowledge about how to operate <laughs> in the place where the two sure. of you are. And so lending a helping hand is just so natural. And I choose, like with my trip to Europe in June, I chose my best friend, someone who I can trust, (laughs) too. I mean, you have to be careful of who you're traveling with. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right, for sure. And it's something that you do that you're together 24-7, although you can split up and you do this museum and I'd rather do that park or whatever. But it's very interesting what you learn about yourself about compatibility and what you learn about the the other that you're traveling with. Very, very interesting. Does it make or break friendships? <laughs> you just learn a lot, and then you choose whether or not you travel again. And you set it up to be the most pleasant for both of you. If mm-hmm. there are definite things that made it unpleasant for one or the other or both of you, you learn, if you're going to do that again, to mm-hmm. avoid those, I mm-hmm. guess I would say. So the best way to get to know somebody is to travel with them then? Oh, (laughs) it is incredible. I recommend it for couples all the time. Mm -hmm. Anyone you could be remotely interested in, (laughs) you need to do it. So if it doesn't work out on the trip, it probably won't work out back at home. There. Wow. There. Because you are confronted with so many things you cannot control and you must resolve on the spot. And so troubleshooting skills, <laughs> uh, frustrations, impatience, anxiety, tolerance. There's a thousand things that can set a person off, which is, of course, the last thing you, mm-hmm. you want to do. Because a lot of things, you just recognize and accept that many things are out of your control. And you learn to go with it. And it will work itself out. People take very good care of you. I was in Haiti at dinner in Capacien, which is the principal city on the north coast, in a small restaurant that was all locals and us. Mm. There were four of us, two men and two women. And we were at a dinner table fairly close to the kitchen door when the power went out. We had mm-hmm. ordered, but our food wasn't, hadn't, wasn't on the table yet. Of course, even if you were in New York and this happened, you, a woman says to herself, where's my handbag? Mm-hmm. And you put it yeah. between your feet, you put it between your knees, on your lap in front of you, you somehow touch it. So... W- I spoke. I speak French. I do not speak Creole, which is uh, Haitian Creole, mm. the language spoke, the, the vernacular in, in 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 Haiti. But most people understand French. Mm. And so we were speaking in English because the others were all English speakers. And um, so we talked about um, what to do. And I suggested we sit tight. That the people who live there and deal with outages, power outages, interruptions to electricity would know better than we. Can It wasn't long before through the kitchen window I could see candlelight. Candles began, began to come out of the kitchen and the first candle, it gives me goosebumps to talk about it, was put on our table. Oh. Hmm. 
you will be better taken care of than locals in a moment of need. You will huh. be attended to first because they, un they understand that you most likely don't know how to deal with this. Mm -hmm. oh, that's really nice of them. It was it an incredible gesture. Let me tell you about another thing in Haiti that happened. A child, we came out of an, for the same four of us, came out of a museum, an art museum in, in Port-au-Prince, which is the capital. And children, about boys, young boys, probably three or four of them, probably in ages four to six or seven, were playing there on the steps. And when they turned and looked at the four of us, they begged. And we gave them nothing. And they walked along with us to our rental car. And I was driving, and I, was, I opened the driver's door. And we all got in. It was a four-door car, and we all got in each of our doors. And in the natural way that you get in a car into the driver's seat, my last leg or foot, the second of the two, was the last thing to put in. And I went to grab the handle as I was putting my leg in. This child, whom I had just refused to give any money to, who had begged, said to me, attention, pied, which means attention, your foot, mm -hmm. meaning careful you don't close the door on your foot. Mm. I said to myself, I looked at his face, I said to myself, I have just refused to give this child anything. It had nothing to do with his sensation of our relationship, nothing. In fact, I don't think they were really beggars by profession. I think they just asked because they saw four white faces. <laughs> and I think they hung around there because they found out that if they asked everybody now and then, they'd Did I get, something? get a little something. Mm -hmm. But they had no malice. It had nothing to do... The way they behaved themselves had nothing to do with the fact that we'd said no. Uh huh. And they, they just walked along because they wanted to hear a foreign language, and mm -hmm. we were adults, and uh -huh. we were different, and we. Yeah. It was just they decided they'd walk and see our car, and then they'd go back and play on the steps again. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I've heard about traveling. It gives you a different perspective because you realize that everybody has that sense of empathy, no matter what the culture is. Just you're human, I'm human. Let me help you out for a second. You got it. That's what I've heard is great about traveling, which is a feeling being, a feeling that I really want to experience, but I've never left the country. So one of these days. You it, will. It, yeah. puts, it puts you in need. And I work so hard if ever I run across a, a speaker of a foreign language traveling here or a tourist, including landing in New Orleans, because we are so poorly set up to receive foreign visitors here compared Definitely. to what you're going to find when you arrive in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so I approach travelers asking if I can't help them out a little bit or clarify something because... It seems like there's this finite amount of kindness in the world. <laughs> and if you've been a recipient of it, it's as if it's your duty, in fact, to be passing it along anyway. I, I maybe would be this way, but my awareness is just total of it because I just receive it constantly, constantly, mm -hmm. constantly, constantly, constantly. And speaking multiple languages has to help a lot, too. It How does. many languages do you speak? Eight. Eight? I knew it was over four. I didn't know it was eight. <laughs> How many languages do you speak, Kyle? Uh, I took German for two years in high school, so one, and I could count to 20 in German. That's about it. That's pretty good. So what other languages do you speak? I am bilingual Spanish and English, and we define that as being able to pass for a native in mm. the culture. Mm. So I lived in Spain for four years. And during probably, I became most aware of it in my third and fourth year, I had friends who didn't know I wasn't a Spaniard. Wow. <laughs> wow. How long were you speaking Spanish before you moved to Spain then? I had had three years in high school. That's it? And I had studied in Mexico oh, okay. uh, a quarter. And I left Mexico fluent in Mexican Spanish and arrived in Madrid Fluent, and then I converted to what's called Iberian Spanish or Peninsular Spanish. Gradually, there's sound changes and vocabulary changes and grammar changes. Mm -hmm. And there, for a while, I was in free variation, sort of speaking some of each. 
And then as I stayed longer, the Mexican sounds, the differences in grammar, the vocabulary terms, etc., just dissipated and faded away. And I this be, this came to my awareness when I had a friend I knew casually but had known over a period of time, I would say four to six months. And finally he said to me, Sue Ann, what province are you from? <laughs> That was a compliment. Uh, yeah. I said, a <laughs> province far from... <laughs> <laughs> well, with Americans, what do you think the overall image or perception of Americans are when you go to different countries? Who likes us the best? <laughs> who likes us the worst? Do they have any sort of overlying <laughs> stereotype of what Americans are like? Well, I don't know if you heard an NPR story on the answer to this very question, mm -hmm. and a sur they surveyed. Oh Western yeah, I have Europeans. seen this. Yeah, I have seen this. Hey, go on though. And from what I remember of the story, almost universally, the f first reaction, speaking about stereotypes, was that they could always recognize uh, mm -hmm. an American mm -hmm. because we are fat. <laughs> <laughs> yep that was the first reply this was a fairly modern study because if you, if the same question would have been asked in the 50s it would have been different answers mm -hmm. don't get me wrong so oh. Is, oh yeah for sure what what would that be in the 50s just I, I one wasn't word there and i didn't oh ask, yeah but for all soldiers then i guess korean or well when you when you read what brides and women say of the american soldiers that were in world war ii it was they were they all smelled so good. Ooh. <laughs> I like that. And they were all so handsome. Oh. I'll take that. Yeah. Should go to Europe. It now. has evolved so much since then. <laughs> so <laughs> this more recent study talked about stereotypes of mm, they are fat, <laughs> uh, they will be wearing a baseball cap, yeah. And they will be wearing clothing that is what we call emblematics, which means has a name of a sports team oh. on it yeah. or some writing with something on it. Huh. I guess I could blend into Europe then. I hate hats and I hate graphic t-shirts. I like to have like this what I'm wearing right now or like plain colors. So I could probably blend in except there for my go. loud voice. There you go. Yeah. yeah, until you open your mouth. Yeah, they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not him. <laughs> To, f to return and finalize the answer to the previous question, how are you received, how does it vary, etc., positive reception of Americans is essentially across the board. I'll give you a couple countries. And a friend called my attention to this one, and then I tested it, and she, she was quite right. I, just, I had been there before, but I returned after she said it, and I just hadn't been aware. Greece. And part of the reason is that there was an enormous, of course, over time migration from Greece here. And almost everyone, because family ties are extremely strong, almost everyone has somebody here, maybe not this generation, but a past one or a couple past, huh. and has stayed in touch and the, Amer the American Greeks return, etc. So they have a particular affinity. They feel something because we took Greeks in and the Greeks who came often did well. Huh. So Greece is my first example. My second example is Ireland, and something similar Ooh. happened because the Irish, of course, migrated in huge numbers. And we have here culturally origins that are from all of Great Britain, the United Kingdom, that is to say Welsh, English, Scottish, and Irish. So I, Irish find an affinity when they come here, and they feel an affinity to us when we go there. What advice would you give me to travel to Europe, fly into Germany, and start traveling on a budget? I would say, I remember when I knew I was going to Europe for the first time, it was... I was in undergrad school, and I had not graduated yet, but it was toward the end of undergrad school. And my university had a charter flight nonstop into Paris and back from London. And round trip was $229. That's cheap. And well, it's London, I guess. it was gone 10 weeks. So I discussed it with my parents. I worked 
uh, was using my own money. I discussed it with my parents, and they encouraged me to go. And I found a family member to go along, a, a female cousin, whose brother lived in Europe. He was with the U.S. Armed Forces, with the U.S. Air Force. And so we knew we would visit him, and we knew we would stay at his place some. So that opened some doors. Mm -hmm. And my mother, told, when the decision was taken, I paid my deposit, my mother told me, you need to go talk to a certain person. She was a former neighbor, but we had moved and she had moved, but within the same suburb. Mm -hmm. We just were in different mm -hmm. houses. So we were no longer neighbor-neighbor, but she was five, seven minutes drive away. I said, fine, I'll give her a call. It was the best piece of advice my mother ever gave me. I went and sat at her kitchen table, and she said, well, the first thing you'll do is you'll get yourself a guidebook. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I said, really? Do you have a particular one to recommend? And she said, well, my husband and I like Arthur Fromer's guidebooks. They're the series on $5 a day. Ooh. And you'll get yourself Europe on $5 a day. I need this. I'm so frugal. I need this. And so I went and I bought myself that book and I began to read it. Well, if you read guidebooks, you'll never stay home. I, I am so enthused. I am ready to go. Any guidebook I read anywhere. I have since switched, and Fromer isn't doing $5 a day anymore. Let me tell you the premise of $5 a day at that point in time, and we, and, and we did it. We did the whole summer on $5 a day. The premise was that you would spend $2.50 to sleep, and that would include breakfast, and hotels yeah. were available for that. You would spend $0.50, cents, excuse me, you would spend a dollar on lunch and a dollar fifty on dinner. So you slept and you ate three meals. On five dollars, your admission to museums and the other things that you did for entertainment and the mm -hmm. sightseeing were above the five dollars, and so was your public transport. But there was so much information in there that you you never hopped in a taxi, <laughs> because I remember distinctly. I still calculate, for example, coming in from the airport in a taxi in Paris right now is about 12 days of expenses on that old system. <sighs> so it's like, oh, God, <laughs> if I use the taxi, I'd have to go home 12 days early. <laughs> Although you can't be on $5 a day either. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I still, that's still my counter, my, my, my measure, my benchmark, my... It's still how I think in increments of five dollars because each one is a day longer I can stay. Uh, so how do you usually travel then? Like train, bus, foot? Yeah, all all of the public transport modes. Just not taxi. That's right. Just I consider keep taxi up. I consider capitulating to a taxi as acknowledging failure. <laughs> Why did you need to get into that taxi? I just recently used blah blah car, b l a b l a c a r dot com, which wow. is based in England, and it's a ride share. It's oh, it's like, like Uber. Uber then. And I used it for Lisbon to Sevilla, huh. and it was out of this world. It was a van, and it was excellent. I used okay. it in both directions. Use and I, the reason I was going to Sevilla was because I was getting trying to get to Marrakesh, Morocco and the budget airline, which sells seats for 10 cents, what? flies out of Sevilla nonstop mm -hmm. into Marrakesh. <laughs> 10 cents? So, Ryanair, I don't know if they're still doing it, but you could find seats for a dime. This That's is crazy. Ryanair awesome. and they're based in Dublin. R-Y-A-N-A-I-R.com So the, the low-cost carrier... Airlines have completely changed Europe. And in fact, riding the trains now is a bit of a luxury because it costs so much more than these low-cost carriers. <laughs> but I think maybe I paid $30 to get from Sevilla to Marrakesh, which was probably an hour and 45-minute flight or two hours flight. So it's a considerable distance yeah. when you think about it for 30 bucks. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. Fromer went on to other things. He is the one who has Budget Travel, the magazine. I would suggest a, a subscription as a Christmas present to yourself because you can learn an awful lot by by reading that over a year's mm -hmm. period of time. You might not want to you might not want to um, renew. How about getting so, to Europe? What's, so, just a moment. Okay. So, now the series I'm using it was founded by Australians and it's Lonely Planet. They have a website, which they've redone. And now 
I find it a little bit harder to navigate, but the I get the Lonely Planet book for the country where I'm going as soon as I know I'm going, even mm. before I know I'm going, to read and get some ideas. Now, for flights, mm-hmm. how to get somewhere. It's now possible to get to Western Europe on a low-cost carrier similar to Southwest, only long-haul flight, which is a very unique market. Virgin Atlantic is one, but their fares, to me, are not quite in the low-cost carrier category, but they're below the legacy airlines of American, United, Mm -hmm. Delta, British Air, Air France, etc. The low-cost carrier that I'm speaking of is Norwegian Air Shuttle, and they fly from Fort Lauderdale and Orlando to Oslo for less than $200. 185, 187, it'll cost you $82 to get over to Fort Lauderdale to, to meet the plane. I'm pretty sure I got ripped off with my airline tickets. <laughs> and then and then you can fly to Oslo. Now, what do I do when I'm in Oslo? That doesn't help me. I didn't mm-hmm. mean to go to Norway and it's it's prohibitively expensive in Norway. Mm-hmm. Well, Norwegian is a low-cost carrier for all of Europe. So you just simply change planes and go to wherever you oh. mean to be. In addition to that, you can take a ferry over to Scotland, start Mm -hmm. in Aberdeen and work your way down, a ferry to Denmark, if Mm -hmm. you like. You can take a train over to Scotland. There's lots of options out from Oslo. It's a bit of an out-of-the-way place to go to, uh, to touch down first, but the key to finding cheap flights into Europe is to know what are the hubs that are the cheapest to get to. Because it doesn't matter where you want to go. If you can get into a hub, you'll mm-hmm. be able to go onward from there on the low-cost carriers. There is a website called whichbudget.com, W-H-I-C-H, budget, B-U-D-G-E-T, all run together, dot com, which will give you the low-cost carriers mm. between any two points on Earth, if there are any. I'm going to look at this then. So then if I want to fly into Bologna... What I do is go to which budget, and I put in Bologna, and it'll give me outward the low-cost carriers. And then I look where they go out for how cheaply, and then I look for one that's a hub. Frankfurt is a hub. Dublin is a hub. London is a hub, but it's got three three airports. And if you include low-cost carriers, it's got five airports. So you can get hung up on spending a lot of money Mm -hmm. in a coach getting from airport to airport if you got to change. You have to be a little bit careful about that. But then what I do is work backwards from where I'm mm-hmm. trying to get, look for a low-cost carrier out of there to a, some sort of hub mm-hmm. where I can get into from the U.S. cheaply. When have you traveled to a new place? What's a good way to pick up basics of the language before you get there so that way you aren't so lost? All the guidebooks have All the guidebooks? phrase, phrase uh, lists good. in the back. So things like a hotel room, asking for a toilet, mm-hmm. uh, menu terms, often food terms, oh, yeah. lots of them. Please and thank you, yes and no, mm, enough to make you uh, uh, polite <laughs> and to show that you've made an effort. And it will completely change the chemistry of how you are received. It is amazingly favorable if you arrive already with a phrase or two and interested mm-hmm. in another or or two. So guidebooks, book your flights on Tuesday, and don't be a arrogant asshole in that way. Well, be a fat American. Yeah, don't be a fat American. <laughs> well, Just kidding. Well, and really, some of us, it's as if we're wearing a sign. So <laughs> we can't, no yeah. matter what. It's interesting trying to blend into the crowd and looking around at what locals, for example, being in a circumstance mm, where... It's all locals and saying, if I really wanted to look just the same and didn't want anybody to look at me, how should I be dressed? Uh, uh, how should I be acting? No baseball so caps. So I, for example, now spend a lot of time in, in Asia. And just because of race, I can never <laughs> look like anything but what yeah. I am. Mm-hmm. The same was true. I was in Bats- Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia, racially, in Africa, I can never be anything but what I am. Or in Haiti. And you can be a proud American, too. I'm proud of being an American. I I do not wear it on my sleeve because I traveled during the Vietnam War and Mm -hmm. found that I had to answer for our involvement and and couldn't do very well. 
and really didn't want to talk about that. So I do not wear the flag. Maybe you've read about not wearing religious jewelry that reveals anything, Mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. It's advisable not to. uh, Not to. Mm -hmm. So I, I do not... I do not wear things that don't stand out that I'm way. aware of that label me as American. Mm-hmm. And I have even traveled and opened my mouth and spoken Spanish and passed myself off as a Spaniard. Wow. Which was very interesting mm-hmm. because then people relate to you completely differently. They think you're a European. Do you have Wonderlust? Want a vacation and a budget? Be sure to check out the show notes. There are plenty of resources in there for you to use. Way too much to list out in a normal outro. Everyday Superhumans is produced by Caroline and Kyle and is recorded on location. Music is composed by Alex Allen. Here's a question for you. How many countries have you been to? Tweet it to us at SuperhumansCast, write to us on our Facebook timeline at facebook.com slash everydaysuperhumans, or you can send us a snapshot of your adventures on Instagram, which is at everydaysuperhumans. Oh, if you like what you're hearing, please leave us a good review on iTunes. That would be cool of you. And also, if you go to superhumans.com slash Oh, yeah, we have a website now. Oh, yeah. The rest of our... (laughs) Check out our website, too, which is everydaysuperhumans.com. That's the most important thing mm-hmm. to do because it links you to everything. Everything, all the newest episodes, Literally. blog posts. We have blog posts yes, on there now. We got blogs. We got Pinterest. We got YouTube. We got Tumblr. If you have a social media account, we are there. That's right. So, and remember, not every hero can fly. So grab your cape and let's go. Let's go on to Sue Ann Tom's PhD. And Sue Ann Tom's and the Globe Trekker. What is it? The Globe name for Trotter? This I, I thought name. it was Sue a, Ann and the Globe Trotter. I don't have a name for this episode. Globe Trekker? <laughs> you didn't name it yet? I haven't named this episode yet. <laughs> oh. Okay. Well, let's move along then. <laughs> it's going to be names. It has a name right now. By the time right you now, hear it, it'll be named. By the time you hear it, so enjoy.